But within that polarity, there's a series of polarity. For instance, every time I come upon myself, I find myself in a very immediate polis or community, that of my family. Every time I come upon myself, there's Lynn, and there are my boys, I'm a part of a family. But then being in community, I say, has certain polarities because I'm not simply a member of the family. I'm a member of a larger community, which I would really like to call the polis, that social web that is over and beyond the immediate community of the family. And this immediate community is defined in different ways, but today it has become the city. And then the polis is also that immediate community plus the practical universe that I live in. And I mean by the practical universe is that largest conception of community that I actually exist in and forge my responses out of. My point in this is to say that that community which is beyond the family and this side of the practical universe which is the city is that aspect of community that finally defines what it means to be an individual what it means to be an individual within a family what it means to be an individual within a practical universe if that's hard for you to get on top of in simple, what I'm saying is that the basic concept of community, which is defined by the category polis, is that which fundamentally determines the image of the individual, the image of the family, and the image of one's practical universe. And in our day, that image of the polis is being radically altered which is necessitating a radical alteration of what it means to be an individual. It is changing the image these are humans minus one just this side of naked self-consciousness perhaps and as they waddle through there's papa out in front who had got the foggiest idea he's a papa followed by mama who went the slightest that she's a mama followed by sister and brothers who wouldn't even know what you were talking about calls you them brothers and sisters i say waddling through the wasteland and sister collapses dead as a doodle <laughs> and old papa comes back and lifts her up and she collapses <laughs> you, you, you see in the slightest he, he lifts her up and she collapses and he slaps her in the face and nothing happens he kicks her and not a budge and finally in desperation he says boys wag her so they pick her up and they carry her for three days and finally the hot sun well, the stink gets so violent, the father can't stand it any longer. And again, on a desperation, not out of any kind of concern, just, just, it's just that damn stink. He, he, he scratches out a hole in the ground and puts old sister in there. He, and, and then they cover her up just to get rid of that smell. He. But after they've covered her up and the smell has gone away, they go out and get some stones and put on top. Not to keep the wolves away. They didn't give a damn about the wolves. It was only the smell. But then something else. Here was the mystery of the mystery of the mystery of the mystery. Death. They didn't have the slightest. Here they were shoved up against the limits. stones on there out of something that you I might call a feeling of the weird or the awe filled and that was the first shrine and pop self-consciousness broke into history perhaps and then another couple of humans minus one came by and they saw the stones that reminded them of a happening that happened to them, that they stopped. And here was the beginning of the city. They discovered, as they met at a shrine, 
that two cubbies could gather more nuts to eat than one. And here began the marketplace, which was added to the shrine. And then they discovered that two cubbies could fight off more wolves than one. And here began the stronghold. And with the shrine and the marketplace and the stronghold began that strange journey of man from the first human settlement to this hour in which all of existence be has become one great human settlement. What a march. We call that the civilizing process. And oh, what a history. At one time, the stronghold was the focal part of human togetherness in the polis. At another time, the marketplace. This came with the late Middle Ages in Western civilization, and that made the city of the bourgeois, or the bur burghers. And this is the only city that you and I, up to this moment, have known about. It's that city we've learned to hate. You know, we talk of the damn slums. No, no, I gotta swear here, because it, those goddamn slums, those narrow, dark streets, those, those paper littered alleys, those, those uncovered garbage heads, that, that city that we hate as little old bourgeois have been fleeing out to the suburbs and the side. And even though you never lived in the midst of, of what I call the city now, you fled. You say, hell, I don't want to live there. But they have the country. It's the city we hate. But the city of the bourgeois is gone. And a brand new city is coming to being. And the irony of it is that no one in the world can escape from living in that city. It's impossible. That's your fate. And you damn well got to make the best of it. I remember when this was first really jawed in my head is when I went to Germany and I was living in Texas at the time. You know, us Texans look upon ourselves as quite cosmopolitan people and are able to kid ourselves till we get our great big old clod hoppers outside our country. And then we see how damn parochial we are. The, I remember a hard-headed Dutchman who smelled my naivete uh, took me outside of a town in Germany and told me to look south. I always think of Bavaria when I think of South in Germany, and when I think of Bavaria, I think of what I saw. The first thing on the horizon, I saw the church steeple, and around it was white cottages, and around the white cottages was a patchwork of fields with those gorgeous colors, you know, browns and yellows and oranges and greens. Oh, there was the pastoral the rustic, the agrarian, the rural pattern of existence. That steeple right in the center, people living around that symbol of the eternal, and then working around their houses. I tell you, there was the rustic mindset. It's the kind of mindset I guess I thought Europe ought to always have. I, I'm the kind of a naive person that uh, though I wouldn't be caught dead in an outside privy unless I had to be caught dead in an outside privy, <laughs> I always thought that Europe ought to remain the way it was pictured in those romantic novels that I studied in high school English. You know, I don't think they ought to improve. They still ought to use outdoor privies. And you know. well, anyway, that was the picture when I looked south. Toward Bavaria, I saw the medieval world. Then he told me to look north, and you know what I think of when I think of north in Germany. I damn well didn't see any church steeple. You know what I saw? Great big smokestacks. And there weren't any white cottages, just a great big black blob. Mm -hmm. Sort of like Los Angeles with the small PCA. And you come in from an aeroplane. This is a great big old black glob down there with mountains sticking out of the top of it. <laughs> of the thing of it. And no, no, no patchwork field. Just that black glob had faded out into a circle of gray glob. And there was the 
technological, industrial, uh, urban world that was here. And then he jarred me to see that that was the kind of a world that I was going to live in. And that I no longer could pretend that if I just kept my head hidden in the sand long enough, that nasty old uh, concept of human settlement he would go away. He even broke some of my illusions that I thought that I could be a knight on a white charger that would come in and do away with this nasty old new means of human settlement. No, the problem that he drove into my skull was not how do I get rid of it or how do I get out of it, both of which impossible, but the question was what in the hell does it mean to be a human being within the midst of it? This is to say that the urban revolution is not geographical. It's a mindset in which the rural mindset has utterly been replaced by the urban mindset. And I think this has to do with our feel after space, with our feel after time, with our feel after personal relations, and with our feel after of how we root ourselves see, in the great evolutionary process itself. And let me see if I can quickly illustrate what I mean. And to do that, I need to go back to Edo, Ohio, where I grew up. Now that term, Edo, the sound, Ada, the sound of it, is exactly the way the town was. As a matter of fact, it was such a small place that in our insecurity, we put a great big sign out along the Pennsylvania Railroad, which, 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 which made Ada a flag stop. We put a big sign out there, the biggest little town in all the world. That was Ada. And I tell you, in Ada, we had a great deal of external space and very little internal space. External space, we had, there was grass run about a mile and a half out to the south. Hawk Creek was about a mile and three quarters. Rings Grove was about three quarters out to, Lafayette was out in the other, it was just a crossroads, you know, three or four miles out. I tell you, we had space and we breathed well in Ada. We had a lot of <laughs> space, but our interior space, our psychological space was all from there. Now you take Lima, Ohio. It, 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 it was just 16 miles away. It was nothing more than an overgrown village. We thought of it as a thriving metropolis. And when our family would go to Lima, Mama, she would announce it two months ahead of time. And we would plot and plan and scheme and intrigue about this long journey down the Lima Pike. To that great metropolis of life. Do you get the feel after that? That was a historic occasion in our existence. I tell you, we had ve we had very little breathing space down inside. Our horizons were narrow. We were parochial in Ada, Ohio. To be parochial is a part of the rural mindset. That's what I was describing when I went to Europe. There. I took a little Ada with me. As a matter of fact, I, I don't know how to put this to you, but, but we had one Negro person in town. And you know, for us people, hey, hell, they were like a man in a zoo. We thought they were sort of our pet. Hey, uh, that would show up. Look, hey, we had a, in those days, we called them coons in Ada. You know, this was a part of our parochialism. Uh, Roman Catholics, we didn't have very many Roman Catholics there. And I tell you, a Roman Catholic was almost, was almost like an exhibit. Hey. Uh, you know, we all knew that Roman Catholics were wrong. Hey. <laughs> That they that they kissed the fanny, I mean the king of uh, the, uh, the ring of the pole. <laughs> we didn't know what awful things they did in there on Sunday for those nights. And now of course we and Ada, we were sort of excited about having those folks here, uh, but we knew they were damn fools. Nothing would have, uh, 
and I say our Spain was very, very narrow. I tell you, in those days, when a missionary came from India or Africa, and especially if it was what we call a lady from those countries, the whole town turned out, which was a reflection of that kind of narrow. Now in the city, it's quite different. Hell, external space in Chicago, we have not. It's flesh upon flesh upon flesh. I tell you, we have a kind of external togetherness there. This <laughs> but in terms of the interior space, laws are massive. If I got a call from one of the girls where I worked that tomorrow I had to be in Tokyo, that wouldn't come anywhere near as the exciting surprise as when Mama announced to her seven children that in two months we were going to, to Lima to see Cousin William eh, and, and Cousin Alice. That, that is to say, the world belongs to me today. Not because it's good. What I'm trying to say is, hell, I just can't help myself. That explosion in Africa is my business. Not because I think it's great, but because that's my world. And that explosion is going to take place in five years. Within five years in South America, that's my damn business. Again, not because that's good or bad, because that's my universe. I cannot help it. My breathing space inside literally covers the globe. It's almost as if to live in the city today is that there aren't any more parochialism. That is to say that now the damn Protestant that sees the Catholic as a freak himself has become a freak. Do you understand that? The, the narrow-minded white man that sees the Negro as something to be held off like this, hell, he has become the ass in the midst, not because that's good or bad. I'm not talking about whether it's good or bad to love the Negro, not even interested in that. What I mean is parochialism is gone, and the best way to become a parochial horse's ass is to try to deny the fact. Do, you, do I communicate what I mean? The same is true about a European. The same is true really about a communist. We kid ourselves at this point, but inside us, the walls have been broken down in a way that would even make Paul tremble when he said, oh, as a matter of fact, another wall that's gone down is the feminine revolution. And whether we men like it or not or think it's good or not, the women have decided to be first-rate citizens in the... the the very arena of human history. I tell you, we have scope, but this is not simply geographic, it's historical. That is, when I look back into the past, there's nothing alien, there's nothing foreign there. It's, 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 it's all my past, see? All of the people there are my friends, see? There are none that are simply alien. I am history. I am not this history, I am all of history. Do you understand what I said? I am all of history, minus none. And when I take a look into the future, hey, there's nothing alien there, nothing can happen that could be foreign to me. I am the future. That's what I mean by the new breathing space that has come. I say it is not good or bad, it's just there in terms of the rural mindset which was narrow and parochial, being broken open by the urban mindset. We have a new sense of space. Now, if you want to get what I'm pushing at, if you act other way, otherwise, what I'm saying to you is that you are saying no to just what's there as your life. But in Ada, the same thing was true of time. Time always has a beat to it, doesn't it? The beat in Ada, the rhythm was something like this. Oh, I can remember it very clearly. We wouldn't have known what was going on if we'd seen the West Side Story. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> now, the beat or the rhythm or the sense of internal time in life has to do with decisions. And in Ada, decisions, they came along every once in a while, and that is today we made a decision, two or three days later, uh, we had another decision to make, a few days later there was a, there was a, a damn decent a, a rhythm to life. Us rural people had sort of got used to this. 
My gracious, you take oh, you take old Leroy Leroy Brown, who lived out there on the Lima Pike, but going the other way from Ada. I think he lived out about two miles. See, when it came time for him to get married, Leroy didn't have much problem at all. He finally married, and I can't think of her name, but she lived about three quarters of a mile on down, see, over the side so on the other side of the road in a farm. And, and uh, maybe, maybe there was one other girl. But hell, Leroy didn't have any problem. You know, he's just maybe one or two girls. I'm quite sure he went up to that girl. I let's call her Alice and said, Alice, uh, I've fallen in love with you. Hey, uh, well, won't you marry me? Wasn't our marriage written in heaven? Hey? You, you see, uh, Leroy didn't have much of a problem. Now you take, even when I got married, I got out of it. And, and, and those ten or twelve, well, those two or three girls. Uh, <laughs> but you see, the problem in that is that when you say yes to this filly rather than that one, hell, I tell you, uh, this is the burden of your freedom. Uh, first of all, well, you uh, uh, she, uh, uh, the next day she isn't going to be the one you said yes to the night before. They uh, they don't stay the same. Uh, and, uh, and then secondly. What you might have been had you married Flo, hell, you'd never be that. You're groomed, you're channeled, and this this is the burden of freedom. And I tell you, when you take my 17-year-old boy, hell, he brings more fillies around the house. They all look good to me. <laughs> and he hasn't even been to college yet. And I don't know how in the hell he's going to decide that. <laughs> That's what I mean. And yet it's not, it's not the, the, the pressure of the many alternatives. It's, it's, it's in the urban mindset today. You experience life as one decision pushing in on the next one, pushing in on, as one fellow put it, life in the urban mentality. One damn decision after another. You understand that you, you know sometimes when you, you find yourself hitting the sack a little earlier, just trying to blot out something, you don't know what in the hell you're trying to blot out. What I like to suggest is it's these decisions that come at you. And yet I I haven't really gotten to the point of it yet. It's as if in the urban mentality, it's not one decision after another. There's a complexity of decisions in every decision you make. Some one of you characters out here today saying, well, wouldn't it just be best to blot out this lucidity and crawl back into some kind of a shell? Yes. That's one way in which you do it. You set up a parochialism that is a self-made parochialism. That is, you build an illusion to live in, to cut out this horrible experience of having to make one complex decision after one more complex decision, and damn it, you're going to die in this kind of a world. I say the problem is not how you get out of it but how you're going to live it. The age of anxiety wasn't here just for 10 years, as we like to pretend to ourselves. The whole new urban mindset from the perspective of the rural mindset, mindset is just one great big age of anxiety. And to be a person, you're either going to choose to live in the midst of that as a lucid person, or you're going to give up selfhood and get yourself some slob to marry that will help prop you up while you waddle in your illusion to your grave. These are the two choices that you have. I don't say this is good. I just say, hell, that's your lot. And the third thing that I think points to the radical alteration in human settlement and therefore in the very style of life has to do with human relations. Now again, you take Ada, Mrs. Ridgeway, lived next door to us. I tell you, we had real intimate relations there. Mrs. Ridgeway had my mama's permission to spank me. I tell you, we were intimate in Ada. <laughs> <laughs> and we called her Annie Ridgeway. Hell, she wasn't related to me, especially when she was spanking me. 
but we had real face-to-face -face relationships. You, 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 you know, we, we could have, it wasn't written there, we could have perverted Boober's I Thou, the way I hear people all over the country perverting it, as if I'm a, a, an I out here and over there's a thou, hey, and uh, we, we worry it up hey, uh, together to become I Thou. You get this? This is to say that the Christian understanding of love was reduced to the rural mindset in which love was this face-to-face -face relation in which I make a gentleman's agreement with her that I will not ask upsetting questions of her if she doesn't of me, and we'll be real, real, real nice to each other, and we'll not puncture each other's illusions, and uh, whenever two people get into a creative dialogue, I'll move in and I'll say, oh, if we just understood each other, you would wipe each other. Or way down underneath, you'd see that you were saying the same thing. That's what I mean by the rural conception of love, some kind of face-to-face -face relationship. But in the new urban mentality that's gone forever and forever and forever, just period, there aren't any face-to-face -face relationships in terms of the new urban mindset. You live right up on top of people that you haven't got the slightest, and you aren't going to get the slightest, and you could try to bring old Ada's conception of Mrs. Ridgeway there, and it would no more fit me eh, than it would fit on the other side of the moon. What I'm trying to say is that human relations have been utterly retooled, like space and like time have been have been retooled. Communities of mutuality are no longer geographical in the urban mindset. Even in Chicago, if I wanted to get my community of mutuality together, they'd have to travel for 50 miles. See? But even that doesn't get to it. My spirit community in this world are spread all over the world. I sat down in Los Angeles, and there I look into the eyes of a spirit brother. I moved halfway around the world, and there is my spirit sister. And, and in terms of this new field, it's almost, as if, it's almost as if time has stood still. We pick up from where we were. The, 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 the community of mutuality spreads over geography in terms of the world becoming one great city. No longer is it a matter of the next door neighbor whose name is Mrs. Ridgeway. Mrs. Ridgeway may live at the other end of the country. And the new conception of love within the city is, 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 is justing love, not the love of mutuality. This is to say that in the new urban mindset, the only way that you can love your neighbor is to be out giving your life for the sake of the structures of civilization which minister unto your neighbor. Now see if I can illustrate that. When I first went to Chicago about a year, two years ago, we had to take that city to pieces, street by street, and socio-political structure by socio-political structure, and put it back together again in order to have some unparochial conception of what our mission to Chicago could be. And when we were doing that, it seems to me I was driven up and down a million streets, and on each street <coughs> there seemed to be a million tall buildings, and in each building almost a million windows. And behind every window a face, I remember one time I was being driven through one of the fingers of the ghetto called Inglewood, and, and as I went by, I looked up on the third floor window, and there a Negro woman's face just went by, j just went by the window, and that's all I saw. But that night, in the middle of the night, I was awakened by a life question, and the question was, Joseph, what in the hell does it mean? to love that Negro woman whose face you saw flip that window and which you'll never see again. Do you understand that? I didn't put that question to life. Life put it to me. And then I was jarred to be awakened under the fact that I had to decide what in the hell it meant to love those millions of faces that I would never see in the city of Chicago. Now in Ada, I tell you it was something different. We knew everybody in town, and everybody had a role. Hell, there was the town drunk. We called him Slim. Ada couldn't have been Ada without old Slim. Slim had himself a role. I tell you, he was in the web of face-to-face -face relations. There was Kenneth Claybaugh. 
He wasn't quite right. He, uh, he was defective. But I tell you, Kenneth was a part of Ada. He had a role that he played in the midst of it. Chicago is different. The urban mindset is different. What would it mean to minister under Slade and to minister under Kenneth? Clay ball in the city of Chicago. What I'm suggesting to you, you've got no way under God's heaven to care for people. Save that you give yourself for the sake of structures, breaking loose the past structures and forging new ones that more adequately minister unto humanness in scope and in depth. The only way I could love that woman down in Inglewood was to move into there and break. Oh, you don't realize it. But in the part of Chicago that I live in, do you know that, that we sent to Congress an 84-year-old white man, 97% Negro where I live, an 84-year-old white man who had been in a wheelchair for five years and who died on the day we elected him? Do you know that? Now what in the hell would it mean to love that Negro woman in Englewood? You couldn't even begin to talk about it. Say you move out and, and interfere with the structures of justice for the sake of building more adequate structures of justice. Now you little old, you little old urban-minded folk that are pretending you're still living out in some kind of a rural community, you wake up and you may be able to conceal, conceal from yourself eh, that you are a human being in history by reducing Christian love into some kind of, of nice little old face-to-face -face relationships, but that's exactly what love is not. In the midst of the 20th century, for the sentinel man or for the man of faith, don't you dare talk to me about loving anyone, save you're out there expending your death at the very edge of the civilizing process that works for the well-being of mankind. What's the difference between the rural mindset and the urban mindset in our day where it has to do with human relations? And the last thing that I want to point to in terms of this alteration has to do with rootage. I don't quite know how to put this. But I have to go back to Ada again. I have to go back to my papa. I buried him a couple of years ago. He was 92 years old. And almost all of papa's life, at least during the lifetime of his three boys, he was irritated at us. And he was irritated at us because we didn't seem to give a damn about the past that was so damned important to him. Do you know that he could not only name all his first cousins, by name, but he could name his second cousins and his third cousins, and he could tell you how they were intertwined way back there. Why, hell, I, I'd have a hard time naming my first cousin. And my boy, oh my lord, is pitiful. <laughs> Lynn decided that she hadn't shown off her three boys to her folks out in the East Coast for a long time, and this last summer, we just decided to take them out. She just decided to take them out there. <laughs> and I was going to a conference and I rode them all the way. So. <laughs> and, 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 and I remember we were coming into Norwich, New York. Who, where, where we got some relatives. And the three boys were in the back seat. And old Lynn, this is his. Now boys, this is your Aunt Alice and your Uncle Alex. It is not Aunt Elizabeth and that's not Uncle Arthur. And the name of your cousins here are Jonathan and so on. Then she turned, Joe, I want, I want to hear you name your cousins, see? And we were rehearsing. And she tells him, now the, the tallest one, he's Alex. That middle one, he's somebody. I couldn't have even, hell, I didn't even know. <laughs> Do you see what I mean? He, Papa was ruled in, in his history. As a matter of fact, Aunt Maggie Matthews, that's my great-great-grandmother, she was a historical event in Papa's life. She wasn't any of mine. 
uh, at all. I, I thought she was a pioneer woman, probably no record of her birth and no record of her death. See? She wasn't any event in my, but for Papa, she was a historical hat. Well, one time I got nostalgic and decided I'd try to see where her grave was, and she was buried in the Huntersville Cemetery. That is about two miles south of Ada. Then you'd turn east for about two miles, and then you'd have to turn back up north uh, up, up about a half a mile. And there used to be an old church, Hellenic church there anymore. And that grass, I, I, I felt like it was that, it was about that high. But I experienced it like this, you know, <laughs> going through that grave. And then those, those, those tombstones, in Ada, in Ada, they, they made tombstones out of that soft sandstone. Hell, they don't last see, at all. And, and, and the broken over, slapped down, I go looking. I never did find the grave of Aunt Maggie Matthews. And he, that didn't come, that would have killed Papa. I'm glad he died he, before I had a chance to disclose that to him. He was ruined in his past. That was the rural mindset. And that was the mindset that man had lived in from the very beginning of human settlement to this very hour that you and I live in. But man is no more rooted there. You find the sentinel individual on the college car, I'm talking about the Slavs. Hell, I know there are Slavs on college campuses, and by a Slav, I mean those who can't face their life and have to create some kind of an illusion about the way life is for themselves. See? But you go to a college campus today, the sentinel individuals, they are not rooted backward, they're rooted forward. That is to say, their sense of attachment to history is in, in terms of the kind of a world that they have to bring into being. Do you understand that? The world that they create is where their anchors are. I, I don't know as to whether or not you're clear about that, but when you want to get a hold of the stuff that anchors me, an awakened student in history. It's what he's going to do in history. It's what he has to do in history. It's the kind of a world he's going to create that finally gives him his rootage in the midst of life. And that isn't good or bad. That's just the way it is. And the individual today has no way of forging a model an image of being an individual, except in the context that I have described for you. He is going to be, if authenticity is going to be, in his very core of his being, he's going to be the utterly unprovoked person. If you've got little private, if you've got little private axes to grind against the Roman, against the Buddhist, against the Frenchman, against the Chinese communist against the black man. And you live in those, all you're doing is saying no to your situation in history today. The second thing to be an authentic person is to live in the midst of a horrifying anxiety of having to make complex decisions that would have rattled the teeth of your mother and your father. Third thing it means to be a human individual in our day is to live in concern for the neighbor that can only be manifest in terms of altering the structures that minister unto the human well-being of all mankind. You've got no other way to do it. And lastly, it's to self-consciously root yourself in the kind of a world that you have to build and you've got no other rootage. Once the medieval universe passed away, you've got no rootage in the past. You will only root yourself in terms of picking up the civilizing process and creating the kind of a world that you demand this world be. And in that activity, you create the very roots of your being. Now, E. Cummings, in one of his poems, said there's a hell of a good universe next door. Let's go. Well, I think that the, the decision facing anyone who's going to be an authentic person is just this. The urban worldview that defines the kind of style that you have to forge is here. And you either live in that world or you try to stop the world and get off. 
but you never get it stopped. It simply grinds you underneath and ushers you to the, to the six foot hole in the ground as one who never lived. Now, mark you, I did not make this world, and neither did you, but that's the world you and I are cast in. To be a man of faith, to be a man who is in Jesus Christ, is to be the man who picks up his world, the one who has cosmic permission to live in the world that's his, and live it to the hilt.